Well, hello, and welcome to this virtual field trip where we're going to take a look at the strata of the Massanutten Synclinorium. We're here at stop number one, which is the Cambrian aged Conicachig formation. It's mainly a limestone, but it's got a little bit of dolo stone in it too. These are both carbonate sedimentary rocks, and they record sedimentation that's like far from any major landmass. If we were close to a major landmass, we'd expect to see some mud mixed in here that's coming off that land or some sand. We don't see that. Instead, what we see is we see a lot of calcite. This calcite's in little particles that are about sand size, but this isn't silica sand, it's calcite sand. So you could call this by the name calc aronite. Aronite is a word that comes from arenaceous or arena, meaning sandy. The Romans, when they had their gladiators fight in an arena, they had plenty of sand down to absorb all the blood. So that's where that term comes from, arenaceous. This calc aronite means we got little particles of calcite that are basically acting as sandy particles uh, in some sort of body of water. And we can get a hint about the nature of that body of water by looking right here. What we see right here are little inclined layers that are at an angle relative to the main bed and those are called cross beds. Cross beds form in a directional current uh, that's moving particles in one direction. And in this case, the uh, current must have been moving from the left toward the right in order to get the cross beds dipping toward the right. They form on the downstream side of a migrating ripple. So these cross beds raise an interesting question. Was this shallow or was this deep? You can get currents in the deep water, like through a turbidity current, something we'll see later in the virtual field trip. But in this case, it's probably shallow. Why do I say that? Well, overall, this rock is pretty light in color, indicating that it doesn't have a whole lot of organic carbon in it. And that is an indication that probably it was pretty well oxygenated at the time of deposition. If there'd been less oxygen, then more organic carbon would have persisted and the rock would be stained a darker color. But that's not solid evidence of shallow water conditions. We need something more conclusive. And there are two things here at this outcrop that indicate fairly for sure that this must have been shallow water deposition. One is the presence of ooids. Ooids are very tiny spherical grains of calcite, chemical sedimentary grains that form through the precipitation of calcite directly from seawater. They coat a little grain of dust. And then the waves reach down and roll them over and they get a coating of calcite on the other side. And so these layers build up over time like um, a jawbreaker or a hailstone. All right, a lot of concentric layers of this chemical calcite. So that's a pretty clear indication that we're within reach of the waves, all right? We're, we're above the wave base for those particles to get rotated around and get a nice even coating of calcite. But still, I want something that's a little bit more conclusive. And there's good news because just this way in the outcrop, we've got something that is bomb proof that indicates shallow water conditions. Let's go take a look. Well, this is what I was referring to. If you look just below me here on the outcrop and you trace out the sedimentary layers, you'll see they go along and then suddenly they dome upward and then they go down again and continue along. That structure with a big dome in the middle is what we call a stromatolite. All right, so stromatolites are actually fossils. Believe it or not, these dome-like sedimentary layers are a fossil, but not of like a dinosaur or even a fish. This is fossil slime. Microbial mats, layers of photosynthesizing bacteria that lived on the seafloor during the Cambrian. These stromatolites are really important because they're one of the major sources of free oxygen in our atmosphere. By photosynthesizing, they take carbon dioxide from the air and suture it to water that surrounds them. And then they end up making glucose and they use that sugar to survive, to power their existence. But the waste product of that reaction is oxygen. 
And just like us, they treat their waste very cavalierly and they just threw it out into the atmosphere. So over time, oxygen levels rose on planet Earth, and in large part, that's thanks to these stromatolites. They polluted the world and made it oxygen rich, which turned out to be great news for animals. So the key thing in terms of interpreting the sedimentology of this site is that you can't be a photosynthesizing layer of slime unless you're within reach of the sunlight. And therefore, for sure, the Konakachig formation was deposited in shallow water conditions. So the take home message of this outcrop of Konakachig formation, when we see these limestones, we want to envision a shallow body of ocean water. So this would look something like the modern day Bahamas. If you go to the Bahamas today, you will see basically that the, uh, there's very little land and there's a lot of calcite being deposited due to high rates of evaporation locally. And the sediment on the seafloor is brilliant white. So it's all this chemical deposition of limestone um, right there on, on site and it's in very shallow water. You'll see ooids there, you'll see cross beds, and you can even see stromatolites which survive in the Bahamas in some of the uh, scoured tidal, tidal channels. These are locations that the currents are too strong for snails to stick to the stromatolites. Uh, stromatolites get very afraid of snails because snails are grazers and they will like nothing better than to snack on a nice microbial map. So stromatolites survive into the modern day, but only in snail-free environments. So, bottom line here is that the Conococheague Formation represents Bahamas-like conditions that prevailed in Virginia's deep geological past. Now let's see what happens next as we head up section. 